Thank you for reminding me. Yeah. <laughs> All right, great. Yeah, as Fred said, thank you all for joining us. My name is Anna Walker, and I'm a species survival officer at the New Mexico Biopark Society. And today I will be talking about the monarch butterfly, one of the most recognizable and celebrated insects in the world. Um, I'll also talk about the conservation status of this iconic insect and kind of give you all some ideas about how to make your little corner of the world more hospitable for this butterfly and other pollinators as well. So before I jump into the monarch, I just want to provide a little bit of context and explain what I do here at the biopark so that it might be more clear why I'm here talking to you about the monarch today. I'm one of three staff in what we call the Center for Species Survival at the New Mexico Biopark Society. And we work in partnership with the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. And it's basically sort of an amalgamation of 1400 organizations who work together to address global conservation issues. The IUCN publishes the Red List of Threatened Species, which you can see the website for here featuring the Morning Cloak, which is a local butterfly species. And the red list is, is not just a, you know, a list of threatened species, it's a comprehensive overview of the conservation status of plant, animal, and fungi species. And really it includes a wealth of information on each species that gets assessed. And um, it acts as sort of a barometer for life, measuring the pressures on life and providing an overall indicator of the health of biodiversity. So the three of us here at the Center for Species Survival spend the bulk of our time digging through primary scientific literature for species, species groups of interest and compiling information relevant to the conservation status of species. And then we write these red list assessments. One of the assessments I'm currently working on is for the monarch butterfly. So hopefully before the end of the year, the assessment will be published on the red list. All right, so moving on to the monarch butterfly, let's start by looking at where in the world the monarch is found. The monarch is native to the Americas, so depending on the time of year, it can be found from southern Canada through the United States, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central America to the northern portions of South America as well. Monarchs are now also found in many other parts of the world, including Europe, mostly uh, southern Spain and Portugal, as well as the Azores and the Canary Islands. They're also found in Australia and New Zealand, many Pacific Islands, including Hawaii, Taiwan, and the Philippines. And it's not entirely clear when monarchs showed up in most of these areas, but we know that they're not native because the larval host plant for the monarch is not native to any of these areas. In most cases, it seems like occasional visitors or vagrants, um, monarch individuals were blown in by big weather events and it wasn't until humans introduced either by accident or on purpose the butterfly's host plants to these areas that the monarch was able to become established. And there are now breeding populations in many of these regions. So for most of this presentation, I'm going to be talking specifically about the migratory monarch, which is actually a subspecies of the monarch. So within its native range, remember just the Americas, the migratory subspecies is found only in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. Uh, in, these other, in other areas, such as the Caribbean, um, through Central America and Northern South America, that's a different subspecies and we won't be talking much about that one today at all. So just for some context, if you can remember back to biology 101, there's a classification system for organisms. So monarchs are insects. They are in the order Lepidoptera, which is the butterflies and moths. They are in the brushfoot family of butterflies, which is a very large, very diverse family. They are in the milkweed butterfly subfamily their scientific name is Danaeus plexippus, and the migratory subspecies that we'll be talking about today is Danaeus plexippus plexippus. So there are a couple of butterflies that look fairly similar to monarchs. So if you see a butterfly out in the field and you're not sure if you're 
looking at a monarch, um, there's a couple ways that you can tell. So this um, photo up in the upper right, this is a painted lady. Painted ladies are not that, they're fairly closely related to monarchs, but not super closely related. And they're quite a bit smaller. Monarchs have big, powerful wings. Um, these other two lookalikes are also quite large, but the painted lady is maybe, I don't know, an inch and a half across, whereas monarchs are maybe up to three inches. So really big butterflies. Um, the bottom right corner, the viceroy, also not very closely related to monarchs, but looks very, very similar because monarchs, queens, and viceroys um, are actually mimics of each other. And all three of them are quite distasteful to predators. So by looking like each other, a bird or a lizard will only have to taste just one to know to forever avoid all three. So the viceroy, if you can see across the hind wing here, there's this dark black line. You'll notice that in the monarch, as well as the queen, they don't have that dark black line. And then the queen is actually another milkweed butterfly, and they are a lot more common here in New Mexico than the monarch is. So you may more likely run into queens than monarchs. And you'll notice that the queen has a lot less uh, black around its veins on its wings, and it also has these kind of larger white splotches. And you can tell this one's a male because it has these um, scent markers right here. So hopefully when you see these butterflies outside now, you'll know how to recognize a monarch. And let's talk about the monarch life cycle. So monarch eggs are laid singly on the underside of a leaf of the host plant. And after about three to five days, they'll hatch. Once the larva chew its way out of the egg, it will begin feeding on the host plant. As it gets bigger, it will shed its skin, also known as molting. And it will do this four times through five instars, which are basically just stages of caterpillar development. So after about uh, 10 to 14 days, the larva will form a chrysalis and enter the pupal stage. And the pupal stage will last about another 10 to 14 days. And then the adult will emerge. So the whole life cycle takes about a month. Um, adult monarchs in most cases live for about two to six weeks. Um, the fall generation that migrates back to overwintering areas, these individuals will actually live for about eight or nine months, so much longer than the summer generations of monarchs. So that brings us to our next point. As you all know, in North America, the monarch undergoes an unparalleled annual migration. And I say unparalleled because there are very few butterfly species that make these two-way migrations like the monarch does. And there also are no butterfly species that travel quite as far as the monarch does. So every year in early spring, millions of monarch butterflies, in good years it can be hundreds of millions, but it hasn't been hundreds of millions for quite a few years now. These butterflies travel from overwintering sites both in central Mexico as well as coastal California to breeding grounds throughout the United States and southern Canada. So through several generations, monarchs will continue traveling north until about September or October. And then that early fall generation will hatch as an adult in a reproductive diapause, which basically just means it's not quite ready to reproduce and it'll embark on that return journey traveling up to 2,500 2, miles back to Mexico or in some cases coastal California where their great 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 grandparents started their journey in the spring. So it's really quite remarkable that you know butterflies scattered across an entire continent can navigate back to a tiny region of Mexico or California that they themselves have never been to. It's not exactly known how they accomplish this. Researchers think they likely use a combination of environmental cues such as the sorry, magnetic pull of the earth, um, maybe the position of the sun, other cues like temperature, day length, and host plant senescence, which is just host plant death, uh, likely help the butterflies decide when it's time to start heading south or west. So as you can see from this map, 
we have two subpopulations here. We have an eastern migratory subpopulation that overwinters in Mexico and spends the summer in eastern portion, every, pretty much everywhere east of the Rocky Mountains in the U.S. And then we also have a western migratory subpopulation, which overwinters in California and then spends the summer um, in the Intermountain West. And you'll notice that there's no milkweed up in um, the Pacific Northwest, so they really don't get too many butter, uh, monarch butterflies up there. So these two, there is some mixing with these two subpopulations, uh, mostly in the Southwest, so they are still uh, related. There's really no differences genetically, but we will be referring to these two subpopulations over the next few slides. So after a long journey, monarchs in the eastern migratory subpopulation start arriving in the mountains of Michoacan and Estado Mexico in central Mexico in early December. This region is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's called the Monarch Butterfly Biosphere Reserve, and it encompasses about 60,000 hectares. It's about 60 miles northwest of Mexico City. On arrival, the monarchs will cluster in oyamel fir trees, like the photo you can see here, and they do this to survive uh, freezing temperatures throughout the winter. So although these forests are quite a bit further south than we are here, they are pretty high elevation, so it does get cold. And then in late March or early April, the butterflies will end their re reproductive diapause, so they'll become reproductively active, and then they'll mate before dispersing north. They typically travel quite far, up to 1,200 miles before females start seeking out young milkweed plants to begin laying their eggs. So kind of about this time of year, we'll start seeing monarch butterflies trickling back into the United States. So in California, fewer individuals are found at overwintering sites. And again, this is the Western migratory population. As you can see from this photo, the monarchs still cluster, but in again, in much smaller numbers. These ones are clustering, I believe, on a, a native Monterey pine, but many other trees are used as well, including non-native eucalyptus trees. So clusters in trees within coastal groves have been reported from around 450 sites, as you can see from this map along a 620 mile stretch of coast from Northern California to Baja California, Mexico. However, not all of these sites remain occupied every winter. In summer breeding areas, monarchs prefer open habitats, including native prairies, weedy fields, meadows, marshes, and roadsides. Adults feed on the flowers of their larval host plant, which is milkweed, as well as many other types of flowers, especially composites. They really like um, plants in the Asteraceae family. Monarchs are rarely found in heavily forested areas, mountains, or desert regions, which is partly why they're actually not very common here in New Mexico, though we do in some years get plenty of monarchs. So like I mentioned, monarch caterpillars feed exclusively on milkweed or plants in the genus Asclepias. And there are around 100 species of milkweed in North America. And while monarchs do prefer some species over others, they can utilize all of them. Milkweed is named for its kind of milky latex sap, which contains um, some secondary plant toxins such as alkaloids and cardenolides which make the plant really distasteful to most animals. Monarch larvae sequester these cardenolides from the milkweed, which makes them distasteful to predators, both as larvae and adults, like I mentioned earlier with the, uh, the mimicry with the viceroy. So interestingly, when caterpillars are feeding on milkweed, they actually chew a hole in the stem at the base of the leaf, and that drains out some of some of that latex sap, which probably makes it more palatable for them as well. So milkweed plants produce flowers in these beautiful umbels, and they have pod-like 
fruits, which kind of split to reveal rows, rows of seeds that have these really beautiful fluffy hair-like fiber, fibers called coma. And those aid in wind dispersal. Those fibers are sort of like down and they've also been used as life jacket stuffing or, or in pillows. So kind of an interesting plant. Uh, there are a lot of milkweed species that are in decline due to things like habitat loss, due to development and agricultural intensification, as well as the use of, of herbicide resistant crops. So one such species is the one shown here in the photo. This is actually San Juan milkweed. It's endemic to San Juan County, New Mexico. So it has a very small range and it's never really found in abundance and it's threatened by habitat loss. And as you can see, it has these really beautiful little dark purple flowers. The Southwest has quite a high diversity of milkweeds. There's about 41 species, I think 26 species in New Mexico alone. And this diversity is a result of um, all of the different topographies, climates, um, geologies, and vegetation types that we have here in New Mexico and the Southwest. All right, so let's look at the monarch population declines. So this is uh, for the Eastern migratory population. And as you can see, there's quite a bit of variability in population from year to year, but there has been sort of a slow steady decline since the 1990s. So in Mexico, every year staff from the World Wildlife Fund go to the monarch overwintering sites and count how many hectares of forest the butterflies occupy. And for the first 10 years of monitoring, sort of in the early 1990s, there were on average about nine hectares occupied every year. And over the last 10 years, there were on average just three hectares occupied. So there has been a, quite a substantial decline. They estimate that about 20 million butterflies can fit into one hectare of forest. So the population has decreased from as much as 360 million in some years, like 1996 to 1997 here, you can see when 18 hectares was occupied. Today, there are typically only around 60 million individuals. So that's a decline of about 80% since the 1990s. And this is a little bit alarming. Researchers have determined that a collapse in the, their migratory behavior is likely if the population drops below about 12 million individuals. And this is because, you know, they, they form those clusters in the winter. So if there aren't as many individuals, it, they have a harder time keeping warm in the winter months. And it's also more difficult for them to find mates across a vast continent during the summer breeding um, time. Similarly, the Western migratory population is monitored at sites along the California coast. Um, this effort is run by the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. And so they organize a Thanksgiving count as well as a New Year's count. And they've been doing this since about 1997. And they have hundreds of volunteers that help them do this every year. While they're out there, they also monitor the habitat quality at the overwintering sites. So unfortunately, the Western migratory population is at very high risk of extinction right now. In 2017, a scientific paper, Schultz et al, examined the likelihood that the Western migra migration will collapse and that the subpopulation will become extinct they found a 72% chance of extinction within 20 years and suggested that if the population drops below 30,000 individuals, collapse is likely to take place. So unfortunately, as you can see from this graph, in 2018, the population dropped to about 30,000. In 2019, it remained just under 30,000. And then this past winter was particularly devastating and they counted only 1,914 individuals at overwintering sites in California. So it does seem like 
our worst fears for the plight of this subpopulation are being realized. Back in the 1980s, some estimate that there were over 10 million butterflies every year at these overwintering grounds. So that's a drop of about 99.9% .9 in the last 40 years. So let's look at why these declines are taking place. The monarch is a very widespread species as we've seen. So it depends on a lot of different habitat types throughout, it, throughout the generations, throughout the migration. So naturally there's a lot of different threats acting on it. Um, in addition, as it is migratory, it's at greater risk because the entire population is concentrated in a small area for part of the year. And then also because individuals have to make this remarkable journey with, with danger around every corner. So the main threats include degradation of breeding habitat, which is the summer breeding areas here at, mostly in the United States. Loss of overwintering habitat, this is both in Mexico, um, illegal logging is problematic at overwintering grounds in Mexico. And in California, habitat loss is also an issue mostly due to urban development. Uh, climate change and the increase in severe weather events is problematic. Um, insecticides, road mowing regimes, invasive species. Again, urban development and logging, as well as disease, have all been identified as threats to the monarch butterfly. So let's talk about a few of these threats a little bit more. Um, again, at overwintering sites, habitat loss is the main threat. In Mexico, um, historical habitat loss and forest fragmentation likely contributed to early declines in monarchs. Uh, hang on, let me turn my video on. My light on one second. Sorry about that. So, never a dull moment, moment with Zoom. <laughs> yeah. So uh, more recently, deforestation due to logging has slowed and um, reserves have been able to become established to protect these areas. But enforcing protections has not always been successful. And you can see here from this picture, this was back in 2015, this shows um, an entire area of protected habitat that was illegally logged. Similarly, in California, like I mentioned earlier, loss and degradation of overwintering habitat due to urban development and a lack of proactive management have contributed to continued loss of coastal growth habitats for decades. So for example, since 1985, at least 76 overwintering sites have been lost. So um, habitat loss in summer breeding areas in the Eastern United States, increased agriculture, in agricultural intensification and the associated declines in milkweed hosts as well as nectar sources um, have been considered the major threat for a long time. So for example, in the upper Midwest, uh, one study in 2012 found milkweed had declined by as much as 58% from 1999 to 2010. So unfortunately, uh, milkweed losses have recently been exacerbated by an increase in the use of glyphosate herbicides within croplands. And this results from expanded use of herbicide resistant genetically modified crops um, such as GM corn and soybean. Severe weather and climate change have also been suggested as threats for the migratory monarch. There have been some habitat suitability models um, showing that Overwintering sites in Mexico and California will likely become less suitable in the coming years for these butterflies. Severe weather events are also quite problematic. Um, for example, there was a particularly cold, wet storm back in 2002 that killed as many as 500 million butterflies at overwintering sites in Mexico. Drought along fall migration routes is also problematic. 
um, the availability of floral resources along these routes is really critical to the fall migration success. And in drought years, these plants just aren't available and the butterflies can't maintain their, their lipid reserves to get them down to Mexico. So enough doom and gloom for now. Let's see what's being done and what we can do to help. So in 2014, the monarch was petitioned for protections under the Federal Endangered Species Act. In December 2020, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service announced that listing the monarch was, quote, warranted but precluded by higher priority actions. So unfortunately, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service agrees that protections are needed but has not provided those protections. And if the status of the monarch does not improve in the next few years, they plan to add it to the Endangered Species Act in 2024. In the meantime, efforts have been underway across the continent to save monarch butterflies and their migration. One example of this is Monarch Joint Venture, which is a nonprofit that brings together federal and state agencies, NGOs, businesses, and academic programs to work together to protect the monarch and its migration. So most conservation efforts focus on building habitat, educating the public, and researching the butterfly and the migration. And there are a lot of other efforts underway to help protect the monarch. This is just an example of one. But in most cases, building habitat is identified as particularly important. Uh, by some estimates, 1 million acres of monarch habitat in summer breeding areas is lost every year due to development and land use change. So luckily, habitat loss is something we can all help address. To combat losses, planting milkweed can be a really great way to help monarchs that are heading north for the summer. You can buy milkweed seeds from most nurseries um, or you can transplant young plants. If you're in Albuquerque or Santa Fe, Plants of the Southwest carries milkweed seeds. And milkweed can be a bit finicky, uh, so it can be difficult to grow, but choosing natives that are accustomed to local soil and climate can help. And if you do plant seeds, make sure that they are cold stratified. So if they don't come cold stratified, which basically just means for a few months, they are at temperatures at about 40 degrees, um, then you'll need to cold stratify them yourself before planting them in the ground. So let's talk for a minute about why another reason it's important to avoid non-native milkweeds, um, particularly tropical milkweed, which is Asclepias parasivica. And this is a popular nursery plant that grows well in Southern California and Florida as well as areas along the Gulf Coast. And this plant doesn't die back in the winter like most native milkweeds do. So unfortunately, it discourages monarchs from migrating and they instead spend the winter um, breeding in areas that they're, you know, are not always suitable for them. And this is problematic for a couple reasons. Every few years, these regions do experience deep freezes. We saw what happened in Texas this, this past year, and these deep freezes will kill off those monarch populations. In addition, uh, non-migratory monarchs have much higher incidence of a debilitating protozoan parasite, which is called OE, and it weakens and often kills monarchs. So encouraging these overwintering, um, overwintering areas by planting tropical milkweed allows these diseases to build up and then they can often spill over into the migratory population. So plant native. Again, um, planting native nectar sources is also another thing you can do. Native plants are better at supporting native wildlife than non-native plants, and they're adapted to local conditions. So they're easier to take care of once established. And this, of course, also means that they need less water, so they can be more affordable as well. So I'll talk about a few of my favorite ne nectar plants, although there are 
a lot of other plants that monarch butterflies as well as many other pollinators will benefit from. Spider milkweed is a good one, especially here in New Mexico, because it is a good um, early milkweed for those early generations of monarchs that are just beginning to move north. And again, it's easy to grow as long as it is cold stratified when you plant it. Native thistles are also great. Thistles contain a lot of nectar and pollen. Um, and in our area, there are quite a few thistles that, that are experiencing population declines. And this is in part because there are other weedy thistles that people don't want in their yards, but they won't discriminate and they'll just remove all thistles. So um, thistles can be a really great plant to grow. Another one, like the photo here, uh, spotted gay feather. Uh, I think some similar species are referred to as prairie blazing star. And this is a really drought tolerant aster um, that's quite easy to grow. It doesn't transplant well, so you have to grow it from seed, but this is a, a favorite among pollinators. Just a couple more to mention, desert broom is a Baccarus species. There are 13 species of Baccarus in New Mexico and butterflies love them. And then chamisa or also known as rabbit brush is a really important nectar source because it blooms in the fall when there aren't very many other nectar sources around. So this one can be good for monarchs on their return migration to Mexico. So another thing we wanna think about is planting plants that are pesticide free. Um, a lot of nurseries, especially large commercial nurseries, may have treated their plants with pesticides. So these toxic levels of insecticides and high levels of fungicides have been detected in a lot of nursery plants. So talk to your nursery, ask if their plants have been treated and let them know that you want plants free of harmful pesticides. They're more likely to make investments in, in these pollinator friendly um, options if their customers make it clear that that's what they want. All right, another great way to help monarchs and pollinators in general is to get involved with one of many available community science initiatives. Here is a short list. I'll go into a couple of these in detail, um, but there are a lot of community science programs for tracking both monarchs as well as their milkweed host plants. So this list will kind of just get you started. Here in New Mexico, Southwest Monarch Study is a great one to get involved with. Uh, over the last few years, with the help of over 600 citizen scientists, um, the Southwest Monarch Study has been able to learn a lot about monarch behavior in the Southwestern United States, which includes New Mexico. So for example, this project through this project, researchers discovered that monarchs in Arizona migrate both to California and Mexico. And as you can see, there hasn't been as much research for this project done here in New Mexico. Uh, and I generally in the fall, there are tagging opportunities here. Uh, so I encourage you to go out to their website and find out more if you're interested in catching monarchs this fall and tagging them so that we can see whether our monarchs all go to Mexico or if some of them end up in California as well. There is another program called the New Mexico Butterfly Monitoring Network. We actually started it here at the Biopark Society last year. Um, this is one of 32 programs nationwide that are collecting data on butterflies. It's under the umbrella of the North American Butterfly Monitoring Network. And we are looking here at all butterflies, not just monarchs, but over time, we will be able to see what the monarch numbers are doing in New Mexico as well. So the data that we're collecting is standardized. We can make comparisons from year to year, from site to site, but also from program to program across the country. So it's a really robust um, data set. And we're hoping to answer questions about the ecology and conservation of New Mexico's butterfly fauna so that um, conservation practitioners, land managers, and policymakers can make 
more informed decisions. If you'd like to get involved, you can reach out to me directly. I'm the director of this program. Um, we've got about 20 volunteers running set routes um, across the state of New Mexico. This year, most of our routes are in the Albuquerque area. We've got a couple up in Santa Fe, Los Alamos, one down in Socorro, and another out towards Grants. But we are looking to expand across the state in future years. So basically, volunteers go out and they walk a set route and they'll just count the number of, of the number and the species of butterflies that they see and they'll do about 12 surveys a year. So again, if this is something you might be interested in, please reach out to me. And otherwise, I can take any questions that you might have. And thanks again for being here. Thanks, thanks Anna. Anna. Oh, oh. You have you a have hand. hand. Oh, OK. Can people unmute themselves or? I just, I just asked, her asked her to, her unmute. to unmute. Sorry, Sorry I'm, I'm echoing. echoing. <laughs> Kat, you're, you're on. on. Hi, thank you very much for all this information. Will this information be available on your website or on your page so that I can go through it? and try and do as much as I can do. Yeah, Anna, we're getting lots of folks who want your slides. Yes, yes. Yeah, I want yeah I'd be happy to give you these slides. I can also, um, I, I can put together a list of resources because there are a lot of really wonderful websites that have a ton of information on monarchs and how you can get involved. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm happy to share a list of resources as well. Okay. okay. That, sounds that sounds good. I really I want to be poly. I mean, I really want to do that. Good. Great. Thank, thank you very much. This is yeah. great. Thank you. Anything else? We had we another had hand for just a second, but it disappeared. Oh, Jeff has a question in the Q&A. Yeah, I mean, this is, the, uh, so Jeff has asked, will a milkweed that has been sprayed remain toxic? If so, how long? And this really depends on what kind of insecticides were used. So um, a lot of the time nurseries will use um, system, or what do they call them? I can't remember the exact term, but they basically have the insecticide within the plant itself. So within all of the plant tissues and these tend to stick around for a lot longer because they're not exposed to environmental conditions like UV. Um, so it, they can remain toxic for, for quite some time. Who else has questions? Systemic insecticide, sorry, I just came back to me. <laughs> Anyone else have questions? Oh, what is the biopark plant to help pollinators? <laughs> um, there we have several different pollinator gardens. So, with pollinators, um, you know whether that's for for butterflies, that means host plants as well as nectar sources. Um, for bees, it's mostly uh, pollen and nectar sources. So it kind of depends on what kind of pollinators you're trying to target. Um, but, you know, basically any flowering native plant is going to help one pollinator or another. So you really, you really can't go wrong if you're planting native plants. And the list is endless. And again, on that list of resources that I'll have Fred um, make available to everybody, I will include some resources that give pretty good guides of, of which plants you can use. Awesome. What about this question from Nancy about her milkweed? 
Yeah, we've, so my showy milkweed comes up each year, but then turns yellow and dies. Can you tell me why? Unfortunately, I can't tell you why. <laughs> um, I am just growing milkweed myself for the first time this year. And I am experiencing that the seeds can be quite finicky. I, I would say maybe half of the areas that I've planted have germinated. I don't know if that means I'll get mature plants or not. Um, but yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know why they yellow and die. You'll have to do more research. <laughs> the good folks at your plant nursery can probably help, especially if you're in one of these native plant nurseries like Plants in the Southwest. And we can always go bug the horticulture team here at the Botanic Garden as well. Yeah, absolutely. Who else has questions? Yeah, we do have several at the garden. There's the, over by the Bugarium, there's a pollinator area and kind of adjacent to the festival green. And over at Tingley, we have a monarch habitat area that has a bunch of milkweeds. Um, yeah. And we actually, with our butterfly monitoring network, we did set up a route at the Botanic Garden, which we don't currently have a volunteer for. Oh. So if anybody wants to survey that route, it is available. So we need to contact you about that, which is? Yes, here, let me write it in the chat. Yeah. Like I know it's red list inverts something, but I don't remember the rest. <laughs> yeah, it's a long one. <laughs> Yeah, so I've just put my email in the chat. Please feel free to reach out if you want to do butterfly monitoring activities or if you just want more information on pollinators. So can I ask, since I've got you here at my disposal, what <laughs> butterflies have you been seeing on your routes so far this year? So this year, uh, unfortunately, we had a very dry winter mm -hmm. and we didn't have a monsoon season last year so quite honestly the butterflies are struggling quite a bit this year um, early spring species include things like the morning cloak which actually overwinters as an adult so that's kind of the first butterfly that shows up and that has been seen at some of our routes um, there's another really cool butterfly called the sandia hair streak which um, was discovered here in the Sandia Mountains. And it's only around for about a month from kind of March to April. So they were out a couple weeks ago. They may still be out now. And they uh, feed on the flowers of bear grass. So if you find bear grass plants in the Sandias, often this time of year, you'll find Sandia hair streaks as well. And they're these really beautiful little greenish brown butterflies that flitter around and are lovely. So I encourage you all to get out to the Sandias and look for those. I did see a two-tailed swallowtail here at the Botanic Garden last week. Those oh, are wonderful. really big. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, those are even bigger than monarchs are. So they are, they are pretty ones. Okay, who else has questions? All right. Well, thank you so much, Anna. This is really fun. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, and we will be uh, pushing pollinators <laughs> here at the biopark. So anybody, if you have any questions, just get in touch with us. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.